few of you might know. And um, Bill is the author of a book, which I haven't read, but sounds like it might be pretty good, <laughs> The Boys of Beach Ridge, the story of the local hunting club camps along the Beach Ridge and the people who chose to live there, mostly unknown to the people of Manchester. Bill has given over 20 years of service to the town of Manchester, serving on the select board, the board of civil authority, the cemetery commission, and as justice of the peace. Please join me in welcoming Bill. Thank you. Well, today, this is kind of a new, new thing for me. I usually have a, a scripted text that I read from, and, and I'm, I'm fairly effective at that. Um, Today, I'm just going to have a few uh, broad notes, and I'm going to try to rely on my memory to tell you some stories about, you know, down, gravel, dirty stories. Not dirty stories <laughs> that way, but I mean, things growing up that happened to me and influenced me. And I want to start with um, MES, Manchester Elementary School. I know it's M-E-M-S, but... When I went there, it was MES, and uh, it was a brand new school when I went there. Uh, it was first known as the Central School. Well, that was, the, that was what it was called, the Central School. And it uh, opened in 1950 and was uh, finished, uh, kept building on it. It was finished in 1951. Um, before that, Manchester had 16, up to 16 school districts. Can you imagine? All these old uh, school buildings we see now, there's many of them left. You can see there were 16 districts. The people couldn't get you know, to school, so they had to have a school close in the neighborhood. And then that was whittled down to seven, and when the central school came in, MES came in, it was whittled down to one. So, um, at the time, I lived over Garrow's store. Well, I'm sure some of you don't know where Garrow's store was. Hey, 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 yeah. Um, Garrow's store was where uh, Cilantro's is now, right at the end of School Street, right on Main Street. And Garrow's store was a very popular place for all the children to go. They had penny candy and whatnot, and up above it, they had two or three different, uh, uh, two th or three stories, and that was the first place I remember living with my mother and father. So obviously I was very close to the school. <laughs> I didn't only have to walk about 200 yards. Then when we moved to, um, we moved to, w across from the diner, the Mountain View Diner, and I'll tell you where that is. It's where Bass is now, in theory, just uh, east of the uh, town green. I live there in an apartment upstairs. And every day I would walk to school and I'd walk through what I called the friendly gauntlet. I would go, I would start there, I would go by the Ford garage where the town green is now. I would go the next building which is still sitting there now was Fowler Insurance, and in the window of Fowler Insurance, there was always this big news bulletin that everybody that walked by would read the news bulletin, and there would be a picture with it about something that happened in the country. And uh, then I walk down, I walk a little further towards school, and I come to the combination cash store. And the combination cash store was around here for many, many years and Bill Manley owned it, and they had a very uh, charismatic employee by the name of Charlie Loisel. He was a pistol, and quite often when I, we went by, he would come out and say, hey, Bill, how you doing? And, you know, that's why I call this a friendly gauntlet. And then you would come to Whipple's Drugstore, and you'd always look in to see if somebody was in there at the soda fountain having a root beer float or something. And uh, then as we walked further up, we had Gadette's store. And then um, for a time, there was Hill's Restaurant, right where the uh, Berkshire Bank office is now. And um, on that way, we would come to a place 
where you would look down and there was a window and that's where the famous Francis Coburn was the barber and he was such a wonderful guy very talented became a painter in his own right later and he would uh, cut our hair I know he used to cut my hair and give me my quarterback as you know it cost a quarter my mom gave him a quarter my dad gave me a quarter and then I'd have my hair cut and, and he'd give it back to me and we would start sitting on a board across his um, chair and then uh, when we got big enough he'd take the board out and we'd sit in the chair so he was just a very charismatic wonderful guy Yeah. Yeah, there was like stages of the board. <laughs> and, and he was just a wonderful guy. And of course, everybody that walked by there always looked down. And when you were in the chair, you always looked up. That was a real trademark of the center in those days. And the center was locally, uh, you know, the stores were all local as opposed to what they are now. Um, Like I say, he used to give me uh, free haircuts. And then we, we'd come to Factory Point Bank. And of course, we know where that is now. It's being renovated very nicely by Bill Drunzik. And uh, you could always look in there, and you would see a number of the, the clerks who were, you know, had lived around here all their lives. And, um, and then as you walked along, you went to, uh, you went with, by Heinel's. Heinel's store was sort of just down from the quality restaurant. And uh, it wasn't it isn't too far from where it is now. That's one of the few uh, stores that still survive now. Um, I graduated in uh, I, I graduated in MES in 1961. Michael was in my class, Mike Noran. Um, I got to tell you a little story about what happened at graduation. I was in the band, and I was became sort of a good trumpet player. And um, so I decided I was going to play a solo at the, the eighth grade graduation. So I practiced it and practiced it. And um, Michael's grand, grandmother yeah. Yeah, uh, was our music teacher, and she uh, guided me and everything. Well, the song I was going to play was a new Broadway uh, play called The Sound of Music. Just had come out. So I was going to play the title song to The Sound of Music. I had it down pat. So when the big night came, the gym was full of people. I went backstage. I, got, I left my trumpet there in the back in the case. I went backstage, got my trumpet, I go out Man, you know, the music stands there, the music is there, everything's ready to go. And the first two notes of the sound of music are, the hills are alive. Well, I tried to play those two notes, and they came out sounding like a wounded water buffalo. It was like, <laughs> and I, what the heck is going on here? Well, the end of this, that story is that one of my enemies, let's say, found out about my trumpet and knew enough about it to sabotage it. And you have three, um, you have three valves in the trumpet and they all have to be lined up with the holes. Well, he, got, he knew my trumpet was there. He took them and switched the valves. I was so embarrassed when I played that. I walked off stage. Everybody was in <laughs> stitches laughing and my face was the color of crimson red. And I didn't know what I was going to do. And one of the teachers came up back. And it was funny. At the end, a lot of people who didn't know what the sound of music was thought it was an act. <laughs> thought it was, it was a comedic act. <laughs> that was the sound of music. But anyways, I ended up playing it. And I didn't play it that well. I was kind of shook up. But anyways, that's one of the stories. When I, that was my day out of uh, MES. Some of the teachers I had there were just phenomenal. We will always remember, Mike and I will always remember these teachers. Uh, Teresa Zulo, uh, Bob Razon, Edna Wright, Effie Miles, Bev Dressler, Mrs. Ellison, Mrs. Smith, Miss Perry, 
and Miss Beatty. Ed Bigelow was at, for a time the supervisor, and then we got ours a dean. Now I want to sag into, you know, this, this is pretty much me growing up in Manchester, and these stories are um, sort of in order. Um, when I lived by the diner, which is where theory is now, you know, of course, the river, the West Branch was down over the bank. And we as kids, uh, you know, I hate to sound like an old curmudgeon, but, um, you know, we didn't have cell phones and computers and <laughs> TVs in our room and all that. So we sort of had to improvise. We had to, so fishing was a big deal with us. We, we wanted to go fishing. So every time it rained, I would go faithfully grab my pole, go down over the bank, and go fishing in the West Branch. And um, the brown trout there were huge. And we would always catch some big brown trout. It was very exciting. And there was, that stretch of river, by the way, was probably one of the best stretches of river to fish for a long way. It was just tremendous. Um, it's a wide <laughs> I do. I I want to tell you. Uh, you know, segue back to the Mill Pond Bridge, where you know the Center Bridge, where the roundabout is now. Supposedly that was called Center Bridge, but I never call it Center Bridge. I always call it the Mill Pond Bridge. I never heard it called the Center Bridge, but it's, apparently that's what it was called. But anyways, we used to stand and look down the river, and would see human waste. <laughs> Brown little things flowing down the river, and that's what my dad said to me. That that's why they call them brown trout. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't need them. We didn't need them. But that was prevalent right in the center of town. This is in the fifties or so. And uh, so there was a place down there where um, it was the remnants of what was BB's Dam. And BB's Dam was this wooden dam that dammed up the river that created power through a generator. I believe they've set that down there, the Riverwalk people. And uh, it, uh, there was the remnants of it there, and it was a good fishing hole. So I went down there one time, I had this brand new lure called the Bat and Kill Special. I was so excited. So I get down there, and it's just perfect conditions, and I look at my reel, and all the string was all wound up around the thing, and I'm standing there, and I can't throw out, and I'm standing there, and all of a sudden, I mean, I had my lure was hanging over this water, white water, that far, and this brown trout came up, wham! I didn't even get my lure in the water and caught this huge fish, and, and I had like two feet of line out. I'll never forget that. Um, and of course, every year I actually go out in the winter and shovel the driveway. I think that was part of the deal for us playing on their property. And we played basketball, and we would soon be down to our coats off. And uh, we also, another place we played was uh, Eddie Campbell's, which is right over here. Uh, that was inside, up above his garage. It was like heaven uh, to be able to go inside and play play basketball. These are the things we did. We played baseball down in Annie Waters Field. Uh, she was one of our classmates of class of 65. And whenever we chose uh, teams, she would be the first one to pick. Because she could hit the ball better than any of us guys. And she could throw it better than any of us guys. And she was more naturally athletic than any of us. So we always remember that. Poor Annie uh, had died a few years ago. Uh, we played, like I said, we played football also on the Marson lawn, and whenever they wanted us to leave, they let their Dalmatian out. <laughs> oh, we'd look up and say, here he comes, and we'd yeah. scatter. <laughs> Instead of just coming out and saying, why don't you guys, you know, leave now. One of the things I want to talk about <laughs> is caddying. Um, of course, going to Equinox, we got that feel for, for golf, and that's, caddying is where it all started. Uh, in the late in the 50s and early in the 60s, we, um, we, I was a caddy at Equinox. And uh, it was a rough bunch there. We're all lower middle uh, income people. And uh, you better be watching yourself when you went up there. 
uh, if you happen to be from a family that maybe had a few more dollars than everybody else, it wasn't going to be good for you. Uh, it was like reverse what, you know, usually the rich people make fun of the, the poor people, right? Not here. The poor people made fun of the rich people. So uh, we had initiations, some strange initiations, uh, when some person came along new and he said, well, you got to be initi initiated. And whoever was a bully of the day was, uh, would, would do whatever it was, uh, hit him in the legs with medals or I don't know, you know, I can't even remember all the things. Um, when things were slow, we used to go out on the, on the golf course hunting for golf balls. Uh, we all were, you know, we all loved to have golf balls. It was kind of a commodity for us. And uh, we would go out on the uh, 15th and 16th holes where there was a ditch across there in those days, right, Fred? And then we, we would uh, take our shoes and socks off and wade in the mud up <laughs> over our knees and feel the golf balls and then bring them out throw them on the bank. Some of them have been in there for ages and were completely ruined, of course. But then we, we, there were certain places on the golf course we could find, uh, you know, balls that we could sell or trade or use. So, uh, caddying, uh, one of the things, probably one of the most unbelievable things that ever happened to me when I was caddy, was we had, we were sort of like a gang. We were like a gang. We had weapons, like a stick, or whatever. We thought we were a gang. I don't know why. And when things were quiet at the golf course, we used to go down the road to a place called the Cars and Inn. It was still standing. It's behind the eight pole now, and there are condos there. And one time we went down there, and it was the remnants of the Cars and Inn. The Cars and Inn was a place that accommodated uh, people that worked at Equinox, and. Uh, so they, the building was still standing, and we got split up from our group, and we were looking for it. You know, we were kids. And um, we heard some noise inside the place, and we come, we open this door, and it's the sort of the lounge or the bar area of this car's been in, abandoned. And as I came in the door, there was a fellow on the end of it who had a bow and arrow, an actual bow and arrow. And he had it pulled back with an arrow in it. And the arrow was a practice arrow. It wasn't you know, a sharp thing or whatever. And he was just kidding. Just kidding. And as we came in, and I saw Dennis way off, we were standing here, oh, we found you, and whatever. And all of a sudden, the string came out of his fingers. And that arrow came right across that room and went shh right there. Well, I hook down. I go down on you know, go down to the floor and these guys were here. Oh my god, we killed Bill! We killed Bill. There were a whole bunch of them and they didn't know what to do. They didn't, you know, they didn't know anything about what to do. And they one guy says, you know, the old cowboy and Indian thing. You gotta push it through. You gotta push it through. I said, don't push it through. Don't push it through. So this one guy took his foot and he actually had to, you know, grab onto that arrow. And I will never forget the loud pop when it came out. It came out of me. Not too much blood. It hurt a lot. And the amazing, ironic coincidence was, well, we gotta get help, we gotta get help. So they go out the door, a couple of them, and who is there, and I'm sure a lot of you don't know who this person is, but his name was Danny Blackburn. And he was known later as Robin Hood. And he used to walk the streets of Manchester and go up by the Orbis, um, yeah, out by the jelly mill up there in that open field, and he would shoot his bow and arrow with his son. He was of some sort of Indian heritage, apparently, and felt that that's what he wanted to do. Well, he was working there that day. So when they came out and said, this kid has got shot by an arrow, he just went crazy. And he ran down the road, he got his vehicle, and come flying up that road, 
I get in the car and these guys will cry at it and they say, oh, Phil's going to die. And uh, I got in the car, they took me to Doc Harwood. He put two stitches in and I walked home. <laughs> so the thing about that is to show you, you know, the frailty of our life is that if I have had five been, you know, down here or up here or whatever, where the arrow had been an inch, I, could, I wouldn't even be here. And this guy's brother was standing behind me. He was a lot shorter than me. He was standing with his head right against behind my shoulder. If I had just gone like that, that arrow would have hit him in his own brother, would have hit him in the face. But it didn't happen. You know, never know what's going to happen. Uh, in the 50s, uh, caddies became obsolete and uh, because of the advent of the uh, ca uh, car. So we figured it was time to head on down the pike and we all, a lot of us moved down to Aquanic where it was much, uh, uh, it was more structured and uh, they had a new caddy shack and one of the strangest things I've ever encountered. When it went down there, all of us equinox, uh, hard knocks of the caddies, were kind of uh, kind of nervous. They didn't really accept us that well, and uh, we learned to play bridge. Can you imagine a bunch of ragtag kids? <laughs> Instead of playing poker, we played bridge. I learned how to play bridge. I still know how to play wow. bridge. I mean, we didn't know exactly how to bid and all that, but we played that game all the time. That was really something. It was some, a tradition at the, at the caddy shack. And they offered us uh, scholarships, of which I availed myself of one, and uh, they had a caddy banquet at the end of the year. And they still are one of the two golf courses in the state of Vermont that have a caddy program. They believe in the worth of, of caddies and the tradition of caddies, thank God. I give them a lot. Back then, uh, if you carried two bags around the golf course, like at Equinox, it's about five miles, they figure, up and down, five miles, carrying two sacks. Some of them had straps that were all frayed, and they would cut in and actually bleed, make your shoulders bleed. Our fee was five dollars cold. Now, if you go to Caddy at a client right now, the same deal, you probably make about 150 bucks or more. You might make $200. Yeah, I know. Price has changed or whatever. <laughs> we were talking about the town and vibers, and um, I don't want to call them the town drunks. They were wonderful people, all of them. They were just charismatic as you could come. Um, we had a share of colorful characters. It was Clem Travenier, Sam Fleming. Quick story about Sam Fleming. Sam was a caddy at Equinox. Uh, he used to come and had a few cocktails before he came. Uh, and he got a loop one time. And he goes out, and I was behind him. And we got to the second hall, and this guy, he says, what's that on the green up there? <laughs> And I said, it looks like a human being. I mean, I'm not sure. It was quite a ways away, you know, 300 and 400 yards away. And, and look, and it was actually Sam Fleming. He had taken the loop, but once he got to the second hole, he couldn't make it, and he just <laughs> passed out on the green. <laughs> <laughs> now, there was uh, Sailor Jack. You know, Mike remembers Sailor Jack. Sailor Jack was a guy, I don't know where he came from or where he ended up. But Sailor Jack would say... Uh, Hey, laddie, I, my name is Sailor Jack. I sailed the seven seas. He says, my submarine is parked down in the Battenkill. <laughs> a quick story about uh, Sailor Jack. One time we met up with him. He was up, however, on the, on the river, on the Battenkill, West Brain. And he was across on the other side. We said, hey, Sailor Jack, how you doing? Oh, my name is Sailor Jack. I sailed the seven seas. Same old thing. Said, yeah, okay, okay. Well, we stood there and watched him for a while. Well, I guess he had to relieve himself. So as he was doing that, I reached down and picked up a pebble. I threw it across the river 
and struck him right in the relieving stem. And he was so mad that he wanted to kill me, and we ran like hell. That's one thing about him. Um, but probably the most charismatic and the one we all loved dearly was Perp Lake. He was just a wonderful guy. A guy who had uh, uh, baseball talents and probably drank those away, and, but he was just a wonderful guy. I ran into him every day and on the center and my friend was gone. And he came up to me one day and he said, Bill, here's that quarter I owe you. And I said, you don't owe me a quarter. He says, yes, I do. I borrowed it from you for, you know, three months ago. And I said, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, he would remember things like that. He had his own, Mike tells me, he had his own cell up in the jail, which was in the village across from, um, across from the Equinox. He had his own cell. It was open. And he would just, when he couldn't navigate anymore, he would just go there and pass out and wake up the next day. Uh, and then I'm told by Mike that the, uh, Bob Far or Tom Farley would every once in a while come down and leave him a bottle. <laughs> but Fur Flake was just a wonderful, and I can't stress this enough, he's just a wonderful gentleman. One time we were standing in front of the old town office on Main Street, and he, he took this lady who came by, and he had a, I always had a felt on it, felt hat on it, and he, and he doffed his cap. He says, Afternoon, man. <laughs> so he goes, afternoon, man. She didn't want anything to do. I can't tell you what he said. <laughs> but he says, you know, something to the sense that he didn't want to talk to her anyway. <laughs> but I, you know what he said, right? <laughs> All right. Uh, I know I'm going a little over. I'm going to start winding down. Um, I gotta tell you a little story about, um, Mike knows this story. It's about a fellow up in, uh, in the Northeast Kingdom whose great aunt died and she left him uh, 150 gold pieces. That was what he left him. Wow. Well, this fellow got the 150 gold pieces and uh, of course, uh, what would he do? He went to that modern Sodom, Burlington, Vermont. So he moved there with all his money. Well, it wasn't too long that he was broke and didn't have any of those 150 gold pieces left. Didn't have anything left. So he took what they call is a reckoning as to where those gold pieces went. He says, okay, the first 50 gold pieces went to alcoholic beverages, including tax. Now, the second 50 gold pieces went to sightly women, which was somewhat taxing also. <laughs> now the third 50 gold pieces, where did they go? Them I must have squandered. <laughs> I, it's just, you couldn't say it any better. I'm going to finish up with uh, just a little description of the person who Maybe who I am, my father. His name was John West. And uh, John was born uh, January 27, 1920, in the building down in Barnardville Road, across from the Beatty Farm. It's a brick building that still stands there now. Um, his mother was actually working that day, and uh, she had to go upstairs to have him. Now, he was born into a family of 13 children. Um, he lived with his grandmother never lived with his mother. Um, he went to the center school, which was right across the road here, um, excuse me, that way, and uh, beside the Zion Church. He graduated from Burnburton in 1938. He signed up for the service in 1942 and served in the Pacific Theater in the Army, attained, uh, attained the rank of sergeant, and earned three bronze battle stars and a good conduct medal and was discharged in 1945. He came back to Manchester and became one of the most civic-minded citizens of this town ever. And I do mean ever. He was a man of vision. He was on the first recreation board 
He was instrumental in envisioning the fairgrounds as a future recreational jewel. He was on the first board of Hildeen and realized the potential of the historic landmark. And he was a personal friend of Peggy Beckwith, the last living uh, family member of the Lincoln family. He was bicent bicentennial chairman for Manchester in 1976. And during that year, I'll never forget, over the grandstands, he had a World Manchester Day where he actually taught, which this was big technology back then, he actually would have had a hold of 22 <clears throat> New Manchesters and had it on a speaker, on a, on a telephone, and so that everybody could hear the other people. There were people from Manchester, New, uh, Missouri, and Manchester, Mass, and there was 22 of them. And he had a conversation with them all, which I thought was one of the most unique things I've ever heard. And um, it was his idea during the bicentennial to have a footpath along the Batten Kill, this west branch of the Batten Kill in the center of town, which, of course, is now the Riverwalk Project. If you haven't heard of the Riverwalk, just Google it. Uh, it is a wonderful, wonderful project to make a walking path behind the historic Manchester Historic District with a bridge across that big gap. You'll be able to see the falls. And they've been working on it for a long time. I was on the committee for a while. Uh, my dad was the first one to come up with that. And he actually made a bridge over that. And because of uh, some bad circumstances, the bridge became uh, obsolete and was taken down. Um, he actually uh, shamed the select board. I remember him uh, in helping build uh, the bridge across the river. He had a, a column every week. And he says, I haven't seen the selectmen around. Where are they? You know, so he got them to come. And he was a charter member of the VFW, one of the founders of the VFW Club. And uh, he was a community builder. He was a chairman of the Green Up Committee and blew up committee, and uh, he ran our first recreation center. Now, there was a recreation center, which was down where Miles is now. It's where their offices are now, and it used to be the Israel Congregation uh, Church, and uh, he got those people to uh, let him play, uh, or go in there, and they had a, we had a dartboard and a pool table and a ping pong table, and he was supervised the people in the depot, the kids in the depot who didn't have a lot of money, like him. And he would do it all for nothing. So he had the first recreation center around here. Nobody even knows that. Um, uh, okay. He was in town and health, health inspector for years. The first water pollution control plant manager at the new plant at the end of Lincoln Avenue. And one of the early leaders of the Little League baseball program and a coach for years. Mike and I have the, the, the pleasure of playing under him on the Outfellows team. Um, he was also a promoter of wrestling matches in, in the MES gym. I never forget that. These guys would come and knock on our door, you know, and I, I was a little kid and there'd be a knock on the door and I'd open the door and I'd see this belt buckle. And I'd look up and there'd be this huge guy, John West here. <laughs> You know, he was just a promoter. He was also on the Selective Service Board and served as chairman of that board. And was selected Manchester's Man of the Year in 1977. He maintained a newspaper column during the Bicentennial Celebration, explaining what was going on, and later wrote a column for the Lions Club. He died of a heart attack in his home, where Pam and I live now, uh, at the age of 58. Now, I know if he'd have lived longer, God knows what he would have done. But he put a lot in those few years that he was here. And uh, he accomplished a lot in his first few years here in Manchester. He did all of this using his wit, his ability to work hard, and a magnetic personality, which made him beloved by all. And I, trying to get the, the Riverwalk, most likely will be dedicated to him since it was his idea. Now, there are so many stories 
that we all have. And it's just wonderful that the library is, and, and Jerry is uh, recording that to, for future generations to look uh, at who we were and some of the stories that you're not going to read on the front page of, of, of the newspaper. And it's just been a pleasure living here. I don't, I'm not to say that everything is fine and dandy all the time. We have the democratic process, and you know, sometimes I've disagreed with things the town have done, and, and vice versa. But I am very proud and know that I am a very lucky person to live here. Thank you.